Hey guys, I've got Peter back on the show today because I obviously been talking every episode <laughs> this season about low carb, carb timing, fasted exercise, females versus males, and really how to be our best selves, perform our best in life and sports. And who else better to talk to about this big topic of fat optimization, fat metabolism is Peter Defty back on the show talking about OFM, optimal fat metabolism, strategic carbohydrates, and of course, our favorite Vespa fuel source for our endurance athletes. Hey, good, What's, uh, good to be here, Debbie. Good to see you. Well, thanks for making a uh, time for us. I know you're all over the place and you've got lots going on. Yeah, literally so, yeah. and figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us kind of where you are. You, you know, we'll all put the, sh I got to remember to put the links to our past podcasts in there. So we have to repeat everything, but what do you feel like has changed the last few years in our industry? As we've talked about this for over 10 years, 15 years, both of us in the low carb world, metabolic efficiency, fat metabolism for endurance athletes. What have you seen changing and why kind of what we were just saying, we need to get out there and speak out more about the importance of listening to our body and figuring out what works best for us as an endurance athlete. Well, you know, I, I think this goes further than just specific endurance sports, because what's the ultimate, ultimate, ultra endurance sport life, right? Yeah, <laughs> so true. <laughs> I would know, say best in life in sports, but right? uh, yeah, endurance of life. I mean, the ultimate ultra, <laughs> the ultimate ultra endurance, that thing called life. You, you know, you, you kind of want to have a good finish, right? Rather than yeah. suffer best to the finish. So let's place it in that context for the audience. So um, my, I, I think my thinking on this is there's something else going on. So I asked the audience right now to be just really still with their brain and just take in what I'm about to say for what it is, not try to put your prejudgment on it. Because there's, there's an interesting concept I've been toying with, um, and that is how technology is actually leveraging some very primitive instincts. And uh, um, can you hold on just a second? Yeah. Well, I think we'll just push pause. For All right. So, so okay, go so, on. So. I think we have to step back from the immediacy of what we're talking about and think about some underlying issues that have been going on with this whole, how this concept I've been noodling on about how modern technology has leveraged very primitive instincts and got us in this chronic fight or flight uh, modality. And there's also, because we can connect with people we can connect with a lot of people who have very similar interests and that tends to leverage that into this sort of tribalism. Mm -hmm. And so what you're seeing, not just in the keto high carb world of endurance sports, you're seeing this binary thinking, whether it comes to politics or religion or, or you know, all these things. So it's, I think at the root, this is part of the issue is you have these camps now that have kind of gone binary. And, and I want the audience to think about themselves in an objective, very calm way. You're an individual. You've got all these variables going on. And not only do you have these var different variables that are unique from everybody else, but they're also dynamic. Meaning we're in a constant state of motion. Time doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. And so you have to recognize that with all this flooding of information and we tend to have these biases to listen to things we think are right and that puts us even further into that rightness of our own mind whether it's your politics your religion your sexual orientation or your sport or your nutrition what you eat and this is a concept people really need to understand in terms of how technology is is really influencing us in ways we don't understand. And we do have a power to think for ourselves. And it starts with recognizing with the sports, nutrition, metabolism, physiology, it starts with this recognition of yourself as an individual, not in an egotistical way, but in a very curious way that we say, okay, yeah, I need to take pieces of all this 
and make it work for me. Now, all that being said, with the rise of, of the ketogenic diet, which has been a good thing in general, there's been this, um, for, I'm going to say it because I can't go off filter. There's been this sort of ketardedness <laughs> of, 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 of it. It's gone too far in this direction where keto is the solution to everything. <laughs> and, and I'm a big believer in a ketogenic diet, but what that ketogenic diet looks like for each person is wildly different. Okay, because what we've seen is to, to generate ketosis in most aerobically fit athletes who aren't totally addicted to carbohydrates, that's not, it's not this super high fat macro and not this super, super low carb macro mm -hmm. that's purported by all the people who are pushing a keto diet so hard. And that, that's a good place to start the conversation is you're an individual and you have this capacity to think for yourself. Don't don't be taken in by the convenience of having somebody else think and tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. So let's dive into the, there's a lot of people I've, or the recommendations for keto to be a fat adapted athlete is going to be a little different for keto for someone that doesn't exercise, like say it's going to be a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think that's what gets misleading all the fasting guidelines out there, intermittent fasting, prolonged fasting, and then keto is, I mean, that's why I think it's so important to talk about this on the show. You are listening. You're probably an endurance athlete, high performing individual that's busy and trying to optimize your health from the inside out, hopefully. Now carbs, we get demonized the carbohydrates and think that, you know, low carb athlete podcast, we're going to say zero carbs. And I'm not saying that I'm saying that what you talk about, Peter, is a strategic carb timing, like not all carbs are bad, but it's also going to, you know, what is a fat adapted athlete? What is a low carb athlete keto endurance? It is finding that right ratio of macronutrients to keep you burning fat, but also teach your body to have the access to that fuel backup fuel tank, that rocket fuel carbohydrates when needed. And that's not evil. It's not bad. I think we start to demonize, as I said, that, you know, carbs are our enemy and we just need to eat high fat. And then we're forgetting about protein, which I'm learning more and more listening and researching oh, that, that protein should be a whole, that's a whole, that's <laughs> yeah. a whole other thing we can talk about. It's I know. Gotten, that's even gone off the rails in my yeah. opinion. Okay. So, they're missing key points. Like so, in nutritional therapy, though, as I learned nutritional therapy practitioner program, nutritional therapy association teaches us eat real food that balances your blood sugar. That, well, that macronutrient that, that, ratio. <laughs> that's a good place to start. However, yeah. you, like I said in the beginning, we have to talk about the dynamic nature of things. So you know, for an athlete, those macros are constantly going to be shifting. There's not going to be one perfect macro for you, the individual. There's going to yeah. be this moving target of macros based on the variables. It's, it's, it's important to become intuitive and to understand how those macros are going to shift with activity levels, stress levels, et cetera, et cetera, exactly. and how you need to reset by restricting carbohydrates and being mindful of stress levels and in all those kind of factors, including vitamin D levels, which I'm not just talking about vitamin D supplementation. I'm, I'm talking about getting in out in the sun for 10 to 15 minutes a day um, in the morning and at noon and exposing as much skin as you're comfortable with and the, and the, and the uh, situation appropriate for so that you can get natural vitamin D um, because, you know, I did my research for the vitamin D mega dosing protocol I implemented I think 12, 13 years ago, um, Michael Hollick, who's a chief researcher, you know, there's like at least 10 other compounds they suspect are being produced through synthesis of vitamin D by natural sunlight. So, you know, there's all these factors. So going back to the nutrition, I don't want to get down that rabbit hole right now, but it's, it's that complex. You, you want to cycle your carbohydrates. And when I talk about carbohydrates, I'm talking about concentrated forms of carbohydrates because non-starchy vegetables, um, they, they literally do not count. And actually, if you're eating a lot of them, uh, 
a significant amount of the, that carbohydrate, all it, all practically all of it, does not transit into your bloodstream. It actually goes to your colon and gets converted into short-chain fatty acids. So it actually counts as a fat mapper. And that, see, this is why I lose people because all of a sudden it gets complicated. So non-starchy carbs from non-starchy vegetables, those are things somebody can eat virtually unlimited because they help keep you full and attenuate that hunger, hunger trigger. And that's really important because when you attenuate the hunger triggers, you can get into that energy balance because we don't have, unless you're training for an Ironman, we don't have the activity levels that evolution really kind of shaped us for. You know, we have this appetite trigger that constantly in the modern world has us overarching our, our, our eating unless we're in that balance of, of optimal fat metabolism where it attenuates a lot of these hunger triggers. So we can fast without effort. So we can exercise without a lot of exogenous calories and we can manage this and stay in that, that a very healthy weight stable environment that allows us to burn fat and metabolize fat, not just for energy, but because this is the important thing for health, fat metabolism, cholesterol, which is cholesterol, includes cholesterol metabolism, which is metabolism of fat, proteins, et cetera, or cell regrowth, mitochondria, hormones, enzymes. It's all done on fat. Glucose is literally a fight or flight fuel, simply a fuel. It's quick burning, it's simple, it's, it's meant to be used for a fight or flight situation. And once again, modern technology has us in this chronic stress state, which is a fight or flight thing. And, and, and females in particular are, are prone to this. So I'm trying to put some context about losing people, but that's, yeah. let's, let's make sure people understand that there's two kinds of carbohydrates, non-starchy vegetable carbohydrates, and you know, your concentrated carbohydrates, which are tubers, um, mm -hmm. root vegetables, some root vegetables, mm -hmm. your grains, et cetera. And again, I totally agree with you, Debbie, whole foods in the diet. And then a little bit, if you're doing super endurance, you're going to need a little bit on your ride and, or ride, runs and, and, you, and, and definitely for your, your racing. And there I actually, we actually recommend you use concentrated carbs because they provide that quick energy source. So, um, what we've seen in the past seven or eight years since the advent of the faster study, that was sort of the study that said, oh, there is something to that adaptation for performance sports. Um, there's been this big run of keto into the endurance sports sphere, right? And people have had a lot of problems. Both you and I have coached a number of people who've gone too low carb, wound up with, with adrenal stress, and, you know, dug themselves big adrenal, adrenal holes. And so you need to have that balance of carbohydrates. Right? And, and the key thing to understand about OFM and real fat adaptation is it's not about a diet. It's about getting your body to burn fat, not eat fat. So that's, that's key word to teach people. We want to burn fat is our goal. So that doesn't mean to eat all this copious amount of fats in our diet. And we tend to forget about, we'll get into protein and then should we have carbs or not? So we have essential fatty acids, essential amino acids, but I think that is, you know, tie that into everything. It is teaching our body to burn fat as our that's main right. fuel source, not eat all fat, only fat. <laughs> and that, yes. And that's what brings it in everything into balance because you, this is the problem in the traditional ketogenic diet almost all of the research done on it that validates what we're supposed to do, right, is based on sedentary or metabolically compromised people. They don't have the aerobic nor the mitochondrial capacity to burn fat at large volumes. And when you're, a, when you're aerobically fit and metabolically fit athlete, you're building up your aerobic capacity, which is key to burning fat, because as we know, fat requires twice the oxygen per calorie that sugar does. So you need to have that aerobic capacity to burn more fat. You also need the mitochondria and that's where fat metabolism is critical because of the other side of it, not the energy production side of it, but for the, re the genesis, the, the mitochondrial bio biogenesis of, of your cells to have a lot of mitochondria to have the capacity, not only to burn fat at high rates and higher intensities, but on race day, when you need to burn some matches with glucose, you have that reserve to do that. 
So that'd be the met- teaching our body to be metabolically flexible is the term for that, correct? So we're well, building would, up that fat I, metabolism. You know, it's kind of it's kind of a more it's more you. I think that's a term that's popular, but I I, I call it a metabolic capacity um, because your body your body, especially the liver, will provide the energy substrate to meet the metabolic need. You know it your body our bodies are amazing and they know how to do it if you got all the things all the hormonal balance the training you know your body will switch to using glucose when you're surging or passing somebody um and it'll use some glycogen but it'll also produce glucose without metabolizing muscle protein the the liver a fat adapted athlete your liver will produce glucose from fat to meet that high-end metabolic need that was shown in the faster study but prior to the faster study we saw tons of athletes who would do fasted exercise hammer at the end and then track their post exercise glucose and they would see 150 and one guy even reached 200 um, a- after his exercise because the body was releasing that that it was the liver was generating glucose to meet that metabolic need so your body's amazing and um you know it, it's it's like getting into that state to where a one or two hour workout you know, you're pretty self-sufficient. You should be pretty self-sufficient to go and do a, a really good quality level workout for one or two hours without requiring hydration or external energy, right? That That's metabolic fitness, metabolic capacity, metabolic flexibility, all wrapped in one, you know? Right? So when is it appropriate to do a fasted workout without any calories? I mean, just water, black coffee, sea salt in your water or something versus... When is it appropriate to add some fuel if it's carbs, protein, and fat, or just carbs? And when, how have you found that? And then there's men versus women. I, I think I think Pareto's law is a good thing to is an easy formula for people to do. 80 20. That's the Pareto's law. 80 20. So 80 percent of your workouts, you should be in. A, they should be fairly aerobic, maybe some surges. But but that being said you know, most people aren't going to be doing more than two, two and a half hour workouts as a workout, right? Mm -hmm. So those are, those can be done. Those should, should and can be done pretty much, you know, as fast as workouts. Now, you know, we recommend using VESPA for longer workouts, like two hour workouts or hour and a half workouts, but you know, that's got 18 calories. It's it's trivial. So would that be protein? What do you call Vespa. It's mostly carbs. It's mostly carbs. Yeah. I mean, so some carb fuel if you need a little. Right. Something. Well, it's 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 negligible. You know, a teaspoon of sugar is is the same thing. It's four or five grams, and you have these literally these ketards, you know, crap in their pants over a teaspoon of sugar because it's sugar. And yes, it is sugar, but people have to step back and say the dose makes the poison. Yeah. Because people are afraid they're going to be kicked out of fat burning and not burn fat if they have any, any type of carbohydrate, refined, sugar. Yeah, sugar. Refined, refined concentrated carbohydrate. It's like, yeah. And this is, this is simply not true. Mm-hmm. If you're an aerobically fit, truly adapted athlete, it's, it, we've found over the years, and I've been doing this for myself personally for 22 years now. And as my day job for the last 12, 13 years, well, let's see, no, 14, 15 years now, uh, 2007, 2008. And so uh, what we found is it's, once you've gotten that fat adapted metabolic phase by doing a metabolic reset, you know, sharply restricting your carbs for a week or two and starting to build up your aerobic base, getting your supplementation, your vitamin D all, all optimized, um, being able to fast and do faster workouts. Once you're there and you bit, and then you build through adaptation by using both high intensity interval tempo workouts and long workouts to build the aerobic capacity to build the mitochondria, it is surprising how much color, co- type carbohydrate tolerance you build up. So this is my message, not just for people like us who are into the endurance sphere, but for people in general. If you want to make this a sustainable lifestyle, the more you're willing to open up that aerobic envelope through various modalities of, of physical activity, you don't have to be an athlete, just you know, working in the yard, doing walks and hikes, all these kinds of things. 
the more you're willing to build your um, aerobic metabolic capacity, the, the more tolerant you become and the less it becomes about a, a restrictive diet. In fact, everybody just comments how they don't even think about it after a year or two because they just cycle in the carbs when they need to. Uh, like Nick Curry, you know, he just set the American record for 24 hours running 173 miles. He has a pizza the night before his races. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so many of these athletes I'm working with, their pre-race meals don't look like a low carb ketogenic athlete type They're of having meal. some carbs in it, but right. Good. That well, they have a lot of carbs. We've yeah. seen that window when you build up that aerobic mitochondrial capacity and have your vitamin D optimized, it's three, four hundred grams, no problem. And, and the next day you're a super fat burn. Those carbs only help it. Yeah. And so that, you don't you, that takes out all the restriction because you don't crave carbs like somebody who's addicted to them, so you can manage them. So you don't have as much, but what you do have doesn't doesn't really impact you as long as you're not doing it chronically. So going back to the fasted exercise, I think for me, what I find exercising first thing in the morning, I don't want to eat solid food <laughs> and go for a run or bike ride or, and I can't eat really a lot, right? If I got up and went swimming. So I think fasted exercise, people say they feel really good. They'd rather not eat anything, but I think it's going back to those strict fasting guidelines that people say, okay, I'm only going to have water, black coffee. I'm going to break my fast. That's right. If I have something. So I'm finding, you know, there's a research study I was just trying to pull up, but that women might burn more fat if they have a little calories before the workout and men show if they eat right after a workout, they can burn more fat versus eating before. But that doesn't mean a meal or, you know, people doing more of a keto carnivore. I'm not going to eat a steak or a burger patty and try to go work out. Oh, so God, it's, no. <laughs> it's what you can digest. So not having anything or like I say, like in my coffee, I have a little mushroom adaptogens, kind of a uh, layered coffee creamer I've been using lately and trying that out or for long run or harder workout, I'll do a Vespa beforehand, but have some sea salt and some water and have my aminos, essential aminos. So I think that is for me works great oh. and not eating solid food. So I think it gets confusing. When is it good to add a little something that might improve your performance versus not doing anything for a weekday workout versus a longer workout we tend to do on the weekends and not feel like you're cheating or you're breaking your fast and that mentality of, all right, I got to stay in that fat burning zone and not break my nutritional ketosis window. Right. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about this binary thinking, these absolutes cause chronic stress and chronic stress is yeah. as big a problem as too many carbo concentrated carbs in the diet. So you're absolutely right, Debbie, because these fasted workouts, when we do OFM fasted workouts. It doesn't mean the trivial calories from best part of problem. I often recommend that people have either a cup of broth or um, a V8 juice or a tomato juice because yeah. it's trivial calories and it's it's a it's a hyd hydration bomb of electrolytes that you actually need. Hydration is critically important to mm -hmm. successful fat adaptation um, because it goes getting your metabolism back to where it should be and your physiology back to where it should be. It completely flips a lot of these um, old wives' tales about salt and cholesterol on their head. And this the fear of salt is a big problem we face in bad adaptation because people just are surprised at just how much salt they actually need to perform both in their sport and daily life mm -hmm. and sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know I've been reading, side note, the the new book by the author that wrote the mineral fix and the salt fix, Dr. Nickelodeon, really long name. That's not his last name, but whatever, <laughs> however you say his name, but he has a new book called win that is all about research and all this, but how we need like 2000 milligrams of sodium before workout, like preload and gradually with some three to five grams of glycine. So different. I would, topic, I but would, I would, used to just I would say I, I I heard that I haven't read the book, but I heard this that being tossed around about bolusing, and that's yes, you need to be on point, but your body regulates sodium and fluid, so 
that's a contextual thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's really important because I, I had this conversation with an athlete this morning because she was going to preload with sodium. And I said, well, what are you doing here? Um, so, but I'm just saying hydration is important, but you, you got to have it in context because, you know, pre-hydrating, if you don't do it right, you just end up peeing it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so no, so <laughs> it's just maintaining optimal blood volume so that you can get the heat out and spice via sweat to, to generate the energy you need. And, that, and that's a that's a moving target because right now we're going through a cold snap. Well, your hydration is going to change a lot compared yeah. to where it might be in two weeks. Right. Well, that's what I call intuitive fueling and intuitive training. You know, yes. we're talking about adapt to your stressors that day, to that weather, to my aura sleep scores, <laughs> to my, exactly. my nutrition, everything's going to change based on well, what is that female, like in a female, and a female, where is she in her cycle? Because, yeah, huge you know, part. In a, you know, from mid luteal to the onset of menses, it gets complicated because yeah. they tend to retain water. Well, that's what I keep trying to share that info as well, especially like the faster study we always bring up is based on men, not women. And Dr. Stacy Sims has a whole different perspective on women training and fasted and low carb. So it's always good to hear it all, but women should really, really individualize their fueling and training program based on their cycle. But, uh, I want to go into kind of follow my questions yep. here. So let's right kind of, for, yeah. The 50 grams versus two, 300 a day grams a day. How do you know, we're just talking about intuitive fueling and training, how to match our nutrition to our training where like how many carbs are, how do we kind of experiment individually? How many carbs are best for me and figure out what is the optimal amount keto camp? People are saying, you know, start 50 grams max a day of your total carbs, not any of the net carb stuff. But for athletes, how do we kind of experiment with how much we should try? What do you suggest to your clients? Well, I think once you're adapted, um, like I said, this is a continuum. The more fat adapted you get, the more your training load, the more carbohydrate you can tolerate. So you want to bring your carbs in around your workout. So before, I like to see, you know, if you're well adapted in training, you know, it, it may look like anywhere from 150 to 250 grams a day of carbohydrate train load. Um, and then roughly half of that amount as a refeed in that first meal uh, uh, after your training, if it's a hard or long training effort. Mm -hmm. um, it's an optimal time because not only will you get that carbohydrate back in to help, help top your glycogen, muscle glycogen stores off, but that you're very insulin sensitive. And this is, this is key. Yeah. Um, you want it, you want, when insulin is, when your insulin's low and your insulin sensitivity is high, insulin is, is highly anabolic. So it, it helps with muscle uh, biogenesis post-workout. So having, you know, I, I, I tend to tell people, depending on their training cycle, you know, you want to have some carbs before your um, workout. And that, that includes not, when I say before, it doesn't mean like a couple hours before, it can mean the night before. I mean, you probably have found that out. You can, mm -hmm. you can do a, 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 a good portion of carbs, like 150, 200, 250 grams of carbs the night before, and you can just go out and smash your workout the next day. So it's, you know, within that window of say three to four hours prior to starting a workout to up to 12 to 16 hours before, mm -hmm. not, not just like right before you can have a little, like a little piece of candy or half a gel before you start to work out your racing or something like that. And then you, you cycle in. Um, if you're in a heavy training block, you want to cycle in some carbs after a hard workout or a long workout. Um, if it's just a workout, you just want to be at baseline. So maybe keep it around 50 to 75 grams, a small portion of a concentrated carb, like, you know, a cup of rice or half a cup of rice not is that's how much you would have a day it's, it's not much and I, I suggest that people look at their concentrated carbs once they understand how many calories are in them and, and stop counting and start just looking I mean mm -hmm. before the invention of, of math and numbers humans <laughs> ate by looking at their food and eating their food so I, I don't want to add that stress. And, and we didn't have another app to track all of our no, I know, and I know. Our it's glucose. <laughs> Um, yeah. so, so here's the deal with OFM, your non-starchy vegetables, you don't count. Mm -hmm. 
Don't count them because they don't count when you're fat adapted. Just look at your, your concentrated carbs. And, and like I say, the more adapted you are, the bigger that goes, the higher the training load, the bigger these numbers go. And then when you have those recovery days, when going into a recovery cycle of a day or two, go super low carb, which is non-starchy vegetables. And don't go too high on the naked protein. Make sure your protein has plenty of fat so you have good protein assimilation and you're not converting a lot of protein into glucose. I mean, that's what that's my big problem with people who are having all these fake foods, these you know, protein shakes and all that. They tend to be high protein, low fat, and it, it's not good for protein assimilation. It's good for glucose, which actually makes you put on a lot of muscle, but it's the wrong kind of muscle fat. So that's cl that's clearly I'm going into the weeds again, but yeah, this is this is uh you can have these carbs and, and we see these two three four hundred grams a day leading up to a race mm -hmm. and then on race day of course on race day you know my rule of thumb is eat what you like eat what you know works and eat what's available don't get stressed out that it has to be this particular fuel or this thing you you want to have that that capacity and flexibility that you talk about by having a strong stomach and gut, that it really doesn't matter because stuff happens in endurance sports. Stuff, you know, you plan, you can't obsessively plan for every little thing, expect it to go that way, right? The only thing you know that will go happen in an ultra or an Ironman is something will happen that you don't expect, yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. You have to roll with the punches, but having a fat adapted physiology allows you that flexibility to go on less, go with something you're not used to, or get by with nothing at all, right? So yep. on that race day, like if you're doing an Ironman, 80, 90% of the calories or 100% of the calories are going to be sugar calories. Because I do not recommend you you have, for, unless you're doing these multi-day things where you're going slow, I do not recommend that. I don't even recommend a lot of protein on, on for race fuel. Just simple carbs. And enough to to give you that little extra to, to push on race day. Well, I think Ironman people are burning a lot more fat than that because they're not going fast unless you're pro. <laughs> so Ironman, right? Is right, but, a but fat digest, burning, right? But, but they're they're digest. burning they're burning their body fat. They're not. Yeah. They don't need to be burning MCT oil because, as a lot of people have found out the hard way, MCT oil can literally go right through you. Yeah, literally those disaster pants stories. Yeah, disaster <laughs> pants races. Yeah, and they found out the hard way. Um, there's just, here's the thing. There's, there's this camp out there um, of experts using quote unquote published science that's telling people they need it, you know, to perform on race day, they need to teach their stomach and gut to be able to process more calories. And this is about, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, to me, I'm, I'm going to just say it because I, I can't, it's, it's about the stupidest strategy there is. I mean, when you sit down to a meal, do you want to go and do a workout? No, I know. It so sits why in would your you stomach. want to be eating when you're yeah. trying to perform physically? It's, no, that's is, how if you're meant to do this. And, and there's a good physiological reason behind it. This well, is important. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I said when I started Ironmans back in 2001, I was following all that old school information and I would be just throwing up instead on the side of the road because I was trying to force my body to have so many calories an hour as we used to be told. And that's why it led me down to being a low carb athlete, metabolically efficient fat burner, but it's, it is, you know, what you can digest and it's not just what you eat, but what are you able to digest and break down? And when you're racing, right. and, and there's, <laughs> and there's, a, there's, there's actually a camp that's actually tells people they need to train their bodies to be able to take yeah. in more. And, and it's, it's ridiculous from a physiological, this is why fat adaptation is so good, not only for your performance, but health, but people need to understand this basic physiology. And it's like, when you're, when you're consuming food, your body needs to send blood to the, your epithelium. That's the lining of your stomach and gut. That's what processes the food. So that's a resource. When you're exercising, you're trying to divert as much blood to your muscles as you can to physically perform. So there's compromises there. So you, and basically, and when it gets hot, yeah. your body basically puts your digestive tract on sleep mode. It can, it can process simple carbs like sugars and electrolytes fluid in the right balance of electrolytes to water and some simple sugars. We can process that through osmosis. It will just pull it through 
because of the osmotic potential. But digestion requires blood. And, and this is where things go horribly wrong for, for endurance athletes who try to process anything in the heat because they can't do it. Their hydration is, is on that ragged edge and things go horribly wrong, as most people know. And people think this is normal and this is a badge of honor and it's just part of racing. It's, I'm here to tell you it's not. Mm -hmm. And on the health side of this, if you're trying to do this, you're, you're creating a lot of oxidative stress by putting these gels through your system and then try not getting the blood flow, the optimal blood flow to digest them. So, uh, you know, because blood is what carries the oxygen. So all of a sudden you get huge oxidative stress on the lining of your stomach and gut that, that it's not used to. And this is why you see this, this pattern in endurance athletes of this, as they start, they got an iron gut, but over the course of two or three years of doing multiple gels during their events, they wind up with GI issues or worse, yeah. candida, et cetera, or leaky autoimmune gut. stuff, leaky gut. So it's, it's like, you know, it's just some basic physiology that, 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 that does it. I, I, you know, it's like bad adaptation is just the way to go because it's the way evolution shaped us. Yeah. Okay. So I got to bring us back to, we're talking about carbs, testing the right amount. So right. just to summarize that is, you know, ideally intuitive fueling, but also measuring, uh, there's carb tolerance tests that Rob Wolf, we did a show on, I think using glucose meters, figure out how much it does, you know, how you feel, should we test or not guess, but also the part two of that, you know, are carbs needed or a lot of people are saying like, there's no essential carbohydrates. Should we just do keto fat and protein and ignore carbs as an athlete? So do you even need to have them is what a lot of the, the it, carnivore it, athletes are saying. Okay. So yeah, the carnivore thing is a whole nother thing, but let's, <laughs> I can explain right. that one too. What, 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 what I find interesting that yes, it's good to have some carbohydrate because it's, it's actually good for, for adaptation because it gives you that push to be able to push right. And to be able to get that adaptive stress, to be able to not only burn carbohydrate, but be able to give you the adaptive stress to build your mitochondria and aerobic capacity to be able to handle more. And this is the problem with straight keto is you downregulate the PDH pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme that, that allows you to tap into carbohydrate quickly. Um, and so when you downregulate that, you're, it's kind of putting a governor on low RPM that you can't perform. So you can't give yourself that adaptive stress. It's called hormesis. You know, that's why you get stronger, fitter, faster with training. You're giving it that adaptive stress and telling the body, hey, I gotta, I gotta get stronger, you know, on a cellular level as well as a muscular level, et cetera. And without that, that push, you're never gonna get the, the optimal fat metabolism. That's why we call it that. And that's why we use carbs strategically is so that you can not only optimize your carbohydrate tolerance and carbohydrate utilization, but also to move that fat burning up to the numbers we're kind of seeing. I mean, when you look at Baster's study for endurance athletes, for endurance athletes this is critical. The, the crossover point, the Brooks, George Brooks crossover point, 65% was the, the limit and, and what, uh, where people crossed over from burning primarily fat to primarily sugar in a well-conditioned aerobic athlete. Well, you know, faster showed people could go up to 75, 80% of the crossover. Well, the testing we got this weekend, we had people crossing over at 89, 90% of their VO2 max, you know? Yeah. And when I used to do testing, I was at 167 heart rate when my heart when I went switched over to all carbs. I have that documented. But I was doing, you know, metabolic testing cart I used to do with New Leaf 2005 to whenever it got stolen from Lifetime Fitness, took it from the rest of the world <laughs> to be able mm -hmm. to use that testing cart. And I, I wish I could have it now to test on people. But so you guys did a test recently. You're just, I think that's a good yeah. kind of to, to roll in this conversation, but how you can test, find out, okay, what is working for that person? But you're saying, you know, to be fat adapted, how much that crossover, the RQ value, which I was just looking at yeah. Lumen is a resting test, breath test, but you can do a metabolic testing cart for someone on a treadmill, but find out where their metabolic crossover point is, where they're burning 
primary fat and you'll see it just kind of drop down and then the carbs go up. So that crossover point is really important. I just did a Instagram post on that yesterday. So that's a great marker to do, but you guys did it with Vespa or what were you testing? Well, we, we did a series of tests. We actually shunted it against Vespa because we did two tests. One was a baseline fasted VO2 max test. And then the very next day, 24 hours later after they cooked their, their legs on a fasted test, they did a fasted test with Vespa. Wow. Yeah. And? And the Vespa <laughs> increased their VO2 max, increased their time to exhaustion, um, shifted their crossover. Uh, of course, some of the guys came in so fat adapted, like Jeff Brown in his first test, he didn't even cross over. Literally, if you want a screen share, I can show you his first day and he doesn't even cross over. Wow. Uh, yeah, I'd have to see if I can pull it up here, but let's see what we got. Uh, you want me to share it or not? Sure, you can do it if people watch video. So uh -huh. while you're pulling that up, I think I should be able to, I can add you to share. Right. So I think that's a, why we want to test and not guess if what works or what, doesn't work. And I think what I'm hearing more in this conversation I'm having with people this year is as fasted ideal. Yes, people feel great, but could you perform better? And I think a lot of people might not realize that, you know, doing a fasted three hour bike ride, or if they're doing strength training, you know, there's, there's performance gains can be increased if you have some calories beforehand versus none is what like we just did Louisa of keto gains and we talked to Rob Wolf and talking to other people in that area of more higher intensity workouts. Can she that can you open can I use share? Yep. Okay. I'll share. Let me pull it up right now. Share. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Right. This is this is a fasted workout. So you guys have so. to watch the YouTube video, the low carb athlete YouTube channel. I'm so. gonna shift over. So this is his fasted. So you know the times go like this, but but I'm going to just, just for, for giggles. RER is the respiratory, where's the RQ? Is that respiratory exchange ratios? RER. That's our, that's our, that's our, now this will blow you away too. Because at one point, his, oh, RER, his REO is not, is below 0.7. Huh. This is stuff that people don't see is because of that, because of the ketones. Um, this is stuff, and this is where we, this is Peter's world for the last 12, 12 14 years is the world that's not supposed to be possible. And, and, and interestingly enough, when we tested Jeff a couple of years in Logan, Utah, at Utah State University, some of the professors were drifting in there from the performance and getting the audience. They said, we got to rewrite the test books because this isn't supposed to happen. And they said, if we didn't know the professor was in there conducting the test, we would have said the technicians, the students had calibrated the machine wrong. And they were doing that on a part of medics, which is the the standard. Yeah, the, the expensive one. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the like expensive ones. This is a, yeah, this is a med graphics, which is the same level. It's, it's a it's sort of a, a higher. So end. he's got 2% grade. How long was each stage? Um, so like we just... started at 2% grade with six miles an hour. And every four minutes, we bumped up a half mile an hour until we capped out it. So keep an eye on, on his carbohydrate burn yeah, fat. And, his, and his RER. This is kind of, this is the stuff that's not supposed to happen. Um, so we have no carbohydrates being burned. Um, now this we, is fasted. This one is fasted. This is just a before. baseline. This is a baseline test. Okay. Shits, shits and giggles uh, because of the, he's so fat adapted that, you know, this is, it, it took him a while to get in and he, so we're going to just go down four minutes, four minutes um, at 2%. And then we just bumped it up until we, he was going nine miles, miles an hour. We had to limit it to nine miles an hour because at 10 miles an hour, the, the, the treadmill would shut off and uh, yeah. would shut off automatically. So at nine miles an hour, after that nine miles an hour for four minutes, we started bumping it up by 1%. The grade. Every four minutes until they tapped out. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. and we will have, that's why I've got to do the executive summary because there's a chart that calculates the equivalent pace at each gradient. So they had to continue with the nine mile an hour pace they had the inclination incline going. So and his heart rate's only 122. Yes. Yeah. 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 This is this is this is fat adaptation. So yeah. We're going down yeah. here. Um, looking at all this. 
and you see he's not burning any fat. And look at his RER. I mean, it's it's 0 0.6, 0 0.59. And I saw these numbers years ago when I did some testing. I bought a pyrrole medics and used it for a while, but I found that this wasn't going to be sustainable because of it's too hard to use. Yeah. Um, and so look at his RER. 0.7 is all fat burning and 1.0 is all sugar burning. But look what we're seeing here. And then we've seen this consistently in tests that people are going, uh, your fat adapted athletes are going below 0.7, whether they're using Vespa or not using Vespa. Okay. So we're going down. I'm just going to scroll down and people can see no carbohydrates being burned. Um, so, now, do you so have a kind of a daily food log? What type of food he menu plan he eats? I know. Like, not anything strict. Not, yeah, that was very tightly controlled. This yeah. was more a real world date. This is pilot data collection. I don't claim it to be science. Yeah. We don't even want to try it because it's pilot data to, to start to bring in the elements we need to have a, a good, well-designed study done by an academic who's going to publish it, right? So here we are. Um, so we're now up to the nine mile an hour minute. Right, he's not even moving. Is, yeah. So is, yeah. His and, fat and, hasn't even changed really. It's still, it's actually getting right. stabilized. He's still at the two. So he's now up to the, now we were up to like the nine mile a minute. So his perceived effort is five, still at the 2%. And this is taking data every two seconds. Okay, so at least his heart rate's now finally up to 164. <laughs> right, right. So now, now we're raising, now here's where, yeah, that's because he's going nine miles an hour. Yeah. An ultra runner, that's fast, right? Um, so now we go to 3% grade. So his heart rate's going up. His respiratory quotient's still in deep fat burning, right? Yeah. Um, we're going to go down. I'm going to scroll down here. 4%. He's still still in deep fat burning. Um, 4%, 4%. He's still now, now, now you can see he's starting to see the stress. His perceived effort's going up. And he got to 5%. I think this is where 5 or 6% is where he tapped out. So, so 5%. people listening uh, are not watching a video. So now is 5%, his heart rate's 78, 178, and he's still our Q value. The well, below 0 0.67. So that's yeah. and still no carbohydrates. Burning fat. Yeah. And so he tapped out at 178 with an RQ of 0 0.66, 0 0.67. And that's his metabolic crossover point where carbs start to kick in after so, that. What's yeah, after and, that? As soon as he tapped out, the carbs kicked in. Oh, wow. So yeah, after, here, is that the end? Is yeah, there anything the after end. that? Right, here's, oh, there the it end. Goes. here's the end right here where I got the, the cursor. And then when mm -hmm. he tapped out and started talking, that's when the carbs started to show up in, recovery. The, in the thing, in the recovery thing. Because at that point of tap out is when he kicked over. Right? Wow. But it took a few seconds for that to show up in the data. And when you're that's testing, will it show a graph to show the metabolic crossover point in a graph format? Yeah, yeah, it's not summarized yet. The, the yeah, count did the testing on summarize it. But Fine. he went, he went for almost wow, 40, 40 minutes. minutes. 40, 40 minutes. Okay. So let me go ahead and. You know what I used to try doing because I did metabolic efficiency testing for a long time and worked. Bob Sebahor did a certification back right. then for metabolic efficiency right. technician he, or something. He, he was doing low carb light. <laughs> yeah. So I was doing these testing until it got taken away. And because we had to order test credits. So that's why you couldn't run the test anymore and they wouldn't give you new products or uh, supplies, but just how to bring someone to anaerobic and then bring them back. Cause you'd say, you know, here, if you went anaerobic, you can't shift back to burning fat again is what we used to be told back when we started doing kind of the low heart rate training, Maffetone type of stuff right. 20 years ago, that you have to stay below that math, max aerobic function heart rate, or else you'll get out of fat burning. But I used to challenge that. Go, okay, if I brought someone to their anaerobic threshold or the metabolic crossword point, a, a lab test is that walk them out, get them back, you know, from showing carbs back to fat burning. And if I started the test again, what would happen? So I used to do like try to double. So here's, here's Jeff's test 24 hours later. And let's just go down to the bottom. And then so what yeah. was in that? So in that hour, so 
or 24 hour period of time was he doing you know got restorative recovery he ate a, yeah he sleep, ate a normal normal day normal day um normal day had a good dinner meat and then potatoes, he refeed like meat, so meat, meat and potatoes okay. nothing nothing exorbitant um meat and potatoes we were trying to keep this real world yeah because we so, want real because part of it is yeah we've developed pilot data for an actual well-designed study but we're also developing pilot data or data for athletes in the real world and, and mm -hmm. the audience needs to keep that in mind is is you and i debbie we work with athletes in the real world people have to keep that in mind because i don't know if you've seen my recent blog but i have this beautiful clip of alan savory talking about science and academia and how you have all these quote unquote experts it's not in a published paper it doesn't exist it's like mm. it, that's not how it really works in the real world yeah. right it's very different you have these variables don't control the real. so here's jeff's second test he went for 40 minutes on that one. Here he goes at almost 43 minutes. So he had a three minute increase in his time to exhaustion, only 24 hours. He, and he could feel his legs were cooked from the previous day. Wow. Now, so here's this is with Vespa thing. beforehand, of, like 30 minutes beforehand, he would take a Vespa. Started, so nothing different than taking Vespa to this yeah, test. Nothing versus different. It was, a fasted, it was a fasted workout. Um, and he had some carbs in the dinner before, yeah, so he did have the night re before yeah. refeed. And that's right. what I want to touch on. You're probably going to run out of time today, but just those people listening, I think we need to, you know, I need to write a blog about this and do a podcast, but what are carbs <laughs> to eat? Because I think people don't even know anymore what real food carb sources, carb Con refeed. Concent concentrated carb yeah it doesn't mean eating that packaged keto food that has you know the crackers the keto bread or all this uh labeled stuff that i think ideally we eat real food sources of more uh, right. you know below the ground type of carbohydrates so so here we go uh, so here you go you, you you went four minute uh four minutes longer which was interesting because that's kind of what he did when we tested him at logan utah too he was able to go four minutes longer on the Vespa, but he was burning a little bit of carbohydrate. And I think part of that's due to the stress of the previous day. Yeah. And then part of it's due to the Vespa, given in that catalyst is, is for flexibility. He's burning more. Go ahead. I just think it'd be kind of cool to uh, look at his CGM scores and his HRV, like via Aura Ring or Whoop, and get that data to correlate with, okay, how his body feels that day. What is this recovery yeah. like? Yeah. So, so here he is, and you know he's going down, and starting the thing. And once he gets going, you know you, you're burning carbohydrates to get going, but then all of a sudden it's he back into fat burn, yep. and that low rate again. And he keeps that low rate till you know he goes in. So here's where they did a shift. When you see this carbohydrate come back in, that's where they shifted the speed up. So you need more energy. What's the quick fuel to get there? So you, mm -hmm. it, it takes the glucose, uses the glucose. This is how sensitive a, a well-adapted athlete is. We saw this consistent with all the athletes. Their their glucose would go up, and then it would settle back down for the mm. rest of the four minutes, and then they kick into the next level. Carbohydrate would come back, settle back down. <laughs> Very interesting pattern. You set, you yeah. know, kick up to the next four minute, the next level, come up, settle back down, and now he's starting to, to you know now he's starting to use some, but but we'll just scroll down here quickly. Um, okay, now we're down to the harder efforts and he's still he's still burning mostly fat but we're now going nine miles an hour we're going to go into three three percent incline so he's he's moving along his heart rate still only 155 at nine miles an hour um but here we go in the the three minute and the three minute uh so we're going nine minutes now okay so here we are in the three so now he's at 164 Yep. heart rate and 0.79 RQ. So that shows he's say yep. 761 he's burning, calories of fat. He's still burning two, third, two thirds fat, one third carb, mm -hmm. right? The 3%. Now he's not going to sustain that, right? But you can see he's still burning two thirds fat, one third carbs. So what does, let's, cause we're going to run out of time here. Where does he kind of stop burning? Does he ever stop burning fat and just go to strict carbs or is he? No, he never does. He never does. He never oh. does. So we'll go, I'll go all the way to the bottom here. Now he's at 4%. So he gets fatigued his body 
or just yeah, sick of running. Yeah, never stops burning <laughs> fat. It's just more yeah, percent. it's still there. And I think the adjusted grade is like this is now we're getting down around you know six minute miles. You get down when he tapped out, he's below a six minute mile. So when so he, he trains normally, like his regular training runs, where is his heart rate? Is he? Do you, it, do you ever it, well, ask for, that? for he's a mountain ultra special, so he's doing a lot of trail running as his training. Yeah, but what is so his heart? Does he train it, by heart his rate? Heart, your heart rate is going to go up and down. A lot of it's perceived effort. You keep an eye on it, but but with the ups and downs, your your heart rate's all over the place. It's like it's like an interval workout. Yeah. can be or a tempo workout so here he is tapping out at 172 beats per minute and i think part of that is due to the fatigue from the previous days hrv was narrower right that window but he's still you know two-thirds little little less than two-thirds fat and a little over a third carbs so the difference of this take invest but beforehand versus nothing beforehand water mm -hmm. i'm sure you hydrate electrolytes before yep. or anything so what was a big like difference between the two days that you summarize what you found so far increase in vo2 max um increase in vo2 max and um increase in time to exhaustion mm -hmm. just more efficient just able to handle a higher speed just be able to handle it so that's basically you're saying that sometimes for performance, as we were talking about, sometimes people will, you can do fasted workouts, but could you have gone faster and performed even better if you had strategic carbohydrates fuel source as a Vespa beforehand, or even during to sustain that level or even withstand fatigue longer duration period until you hit fatigue. Yeah. 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 And so that's even with the, so yeah, you know, people are going to take a part of this because that's just the way they are, but and that's what I'm saying. This is just pilot data, but these are the takeaways we got and, and we, you know, sure there's a possibility of placebo effect. And if it's a placebo, it's a darn good placebo, right? So you use it, but we were actually shunting the, the data collection against, not in favor of the best, but by, by doing it first. Be interesting to see what these guys would do on on, on fresh legs right yeah uh, so anyway let's go let's so, finish this up yeah yeah so i think that's great information just to summarize the point of this talk today is not all carbs are evil when to strategically place those carbohydrates to improve fat loss and performance but also the main goal i think we were talking about longevity how you are going to be your future self. So performance as an athlete, you know, what'd you say? I like, I wrote that down endurance for life to keep up with right, life. Right. Life is the <laughs> ultimate endurance Life sport. is your endurance sport, right. but how to so, do that as an athlete, because all the information out there, we keep hearing about are for metabolically damaged. People are not, not the athletic side. So I'm trying to clarify, here's some templates because it's n equals one journey and experiment for the athlete someone that's doing you know you're mostly ultra runners triathletes endurance but also people just working out just like triathlons i work out twice a day sometimes three times if i had strength training in so it's take this information and see how you can improve well, your fat loss and performance right and Je like jeff for example he does a lot of strength training because he's 50 years old and to maintain his his top of the sport. I mean, at 50 years old, he's still one of the top 100 mile specialists in trails, not in trail ultra. You know, there are some really good young runners that will beat him on any given day, but it's not like he's in the mix. And so he says, I got to do strength training. And, and yeah, but to close this out, I mean, you know, a lot of these other guys who are doing more strength based training and sports, you really got to do the get get fat adapted and really push your aerobic capacity first because I see that yeah people put on these big muscles and all but it's not really it's not going to give them the, the capacity and resilience they need that that building that aerobic base does and then doing strength training on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think for the aging athlete, as I keep trying to focus on on this show, is that you know we do need to eat more protein, <laughs> and I keep hearing you know, other people say prioritize protein and then your fats and then placing those carbs in when you need them, where they'll help you the most as an athlete. 
and then yeah. lift, lifting heavy things, not doing so much cardio. Yeah, that's, I would, I would challenge that as a much more nuanced thing. I, I don't think the pro, I think the protein thing right now is a big trendy thing. And another, they're all trends, aren't they? It comes right, and goes. they are. And, and it's not, it's people, what people are talking about is the assimilation of protein. And that's yeah. where being fat adapted, having a good stomach and epithelial fasting, and then having a, a, a protein slash fat rich meal causes really good bile ejection, which is key to protein assimilation. So the protein assimilation thing hasn't been been talked about, nor has whole animal eating. A lot of the carnivores talk about whole animal eating, but you see them posting pictures of three pounds of ribeye steaks. And you gotta you gotta have the collagen based foods, you gotta have the, a little bit of the organ meats and 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 all that is key to proper protein assimilation. And when you do that properly, the amount of protein you eat it's it's, it's surprisingly small. And I'm I'm a guy who loves to eat steaks once in a while. Yeah. And, but but I have to be objectively speaking from looking at the physiology and metabolism and the real world and thinking about it from an evolutionary perspective, it's, it's, it's really surprising how efficient our, our bodies are if we allow them to. But if, you, if you're just eating a lot of muscle meat, that's, that's kind of hard on your body. I'm sure you're going to get some results, but it's not optimal. Well, that's why I do a lot of essential aminos and bone broth. I've been doing a cup of bone broth or two a day and I just love it. My body is just so nice to have and just put some truffle yeah. oil in it or sea salt. It's really good. It, it, but, it's, it, that's one of my big, big things I'm, I push a lot on these people is like, you got to get the collagen rich yeah. foods with all the different collagen because collagen makes up at least a third of the proteins in our body and mm -hmm. they are relatively high turnover proteins compared to muscle tissue mm -hmm. and yet we we in the western world don't eat a lot of collagen rich foods now last couple of days i've been in tucson arizona and i love the sonoran style menudo so i've been having i've had menudo twice here today in the last couple of days and what is that it, it's tripe soup oh <laughs> yeah i'm a big i i'm a big eater of menudo compata uh, shark fin soup chicken feet soup pig's ears pig's feet I mean, yeah. all that stuff, because that's, that's your richest source of collagen and it beats any supplement. Yeah. I've, I've, well, we're going to run out of time, but that's a whole nother show is talking about protein consumption and being able to break it down properly, digest it. Most people eat in the sympathetic state and most people don't have enough digestive enzymes and HCL to even break down that protein properly. And then they're just eating, chewing so little and eating so fast they're they're having some probably that's right <laughs> not even protein, all of that so, that, so that's yeah. why i love bone broth and and i was going to add in a lot of the collagen powders i'm hearing aren't of course ideal to having collagen from the real food sources as a yeah, bone broth most of the most of the, by 80 percent of the collagen supplements out there are from high collagen which is skin collagen and it's good but you need the not whole the variety. It's, it's not that it's the best. It's good, but it's only one compound. You need all of them. It's just like yeah. I just say about training. You don't need to do just constant cardio. You need to do hit, resistance, yeah. tempo. It's a mix. I That's with everything. I keep saying this and I'll stop talking, but it's variation. Everything we talk about is mix it up, muscle confusion, the Goldilocks effect, yep. variation. The whole fasting, keto, carnivore, paleo, exercise all that is mix it up. Don't yeah, I, I think to close, thing. yeah, I think to close out, you know, the audience needs to realize if it's dumbed down and simplified, nobody says you got dumb it down, you got dumb it down. I get that I got to make it simpler because I'm I'm way off in the weeds with this stuff and down all these rabbit holes. But that's my job. I make it simple. <laughs> you're right, and right. But that's what I do too. It's like I make it doable in the context of somebody's real life, but they got to realize it's not simple, it's dynamic, it's constantly moving. And it, most of all, it's individualized. So you've got to do some work on your own if you want the best for you. Yeah. You'll get results with a training program. You'll get results with a diet. It won't be sustainable and it won't get the optimal results for you. So you've got to be engaged, involved, and think for yourself. Yep. Yeah. That's why people need coaches, you know, athletes yep. of all levels and people just trying to navigate through all this really need personalized coaching at least three months to really figure out what works for them, because what works for me is not going to be the same for you. And that we are always that N equals one experiment. So for sure. People and, and the beauty of the, yeah. And the beauty of that adaptation from what I've seen working with hundreds of athletes is once you're fat adapted and athletic, because exercise is non-negotiable, you have to be physically active. 
once you get down that path, it, you sort of, it is sustainable and people figure it out for themselves and they, they make these life choices. You know, I see so many of the athletes, one of the ones I worked with for years, Brian, he's in Tucson building his dream home, which is a dream home. We'll feature it, but it's a dream home that's in, in alignment with nature. It's got all the EMF. You have to hardwire if you want to get to the internet. He's got it. it basically, the, all the large rooms are Faraday cages. It's got these big windows that open up. Uh, sliding doors that open up to the, the yard and it's 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 all designed in a way that that is for clean living harmonizing you know all the lumbers treated so there's no mold etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know he's gone down this path and as he's come from being a high carb athlete Xterra athlete to OFM athlete to this he's doing he's on this journey to really do it and I see this people just make good choices and it's sustainable yeah. So I got to close it up. So where can people find you? It's OFM.io. OFM.io. Or you can go I-O. to sign up for the Beyond Keto ebook at beyondketo.info. And then if you want to get Vespa, uh, which is a good first step, if you're, if you're new to fat adaptation, you don't want to change your diet, you just want to get a taste of what fat adaptation feels like. Just get a 12 pack of Vespa and play with it because it's a natural metabolic catalyst that shifts your body to burning more fat. And because it works with your body, it doesn't give you that rush, but you don't get the crash either. It's like we tell people what you notice, what you don't know. So you just feel naturally strong, focused, and you don't have soreness afterwards because by burning more fat, you don't have the oxidative stress to recover from. So you're preventing damage. Yeah. That's and that's and so one. that's a and that's a big part of, of the whole thing is it'll get you started. You don't have to change a thing, just get started with Vespa and then you'll you'll kind of want more. That seems to be the pattern. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for your time. We'll put everything in the show notes. I gotta remember put all that in there and yeah. we'll talk to you soon. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Debbie. You.